be with you for a few. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, I know much of y'all's work and I'm thankful for it. I've heard about it through the years and uh, I hope you will continue to be uh, the tremendous blessing that you are. Well, mm -hmm. I have found that the last um, several years have been extremely challenging years. Mm -hmm. I mean, extremely challenging years. If you're walking around on planet Earth, it's not been an easy place to live the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the love of God for just a few minutes. Uh, give me a few minutes to talk about that. There's a guy named Roland Stewart that you would see on television at major league football games, soccer games, at NBA basketball games, and at major league baseball games. And he would always have a red, white, and blue Afro wig on. And he had a shirt on that said John 316. John 316. When Tim Tebow played for the Florida Gators, he wore as his eye black John 316. It is the most famous verse in all the world. One writer called it a 25-word prayer of hope. Uh, it's the most famous verse in all the Bible by far. The next famous verse is um, less than 10% as famous as that verse is. We sing a song, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardon from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And then the refrain of the verse says, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angel song. I think about how unfathomable the love of God is, that it is uncomprehendable or incomprehensible. There's nothing in the world like it. And I think I've heard people say through the years, God's love is so big that we can never grasp it, that we can never consume it. We can never think of it. It's too big for us to get our arms around. But there's a problem with that, though. If you've got your Bible for just a moment, look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, Paul writes these words. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effective working of his power. Unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which is from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent now that the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him and notch verse 17 now that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of god now see what he says here in verse 18, that you may have the power to understand, that you may know, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Paul writes, I want you to comprehend the love of God. You know, there are some things about God we'll never figure out. We'll never figure out his ways. His ways are higher than our ways. We'll have a hard time sometimes figuring out his plan for our life. There's some things that are too big for us to understand. Or as I like to say, God is unfigureoutable. 
we 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 won't understand fully understand the wisdom of God. It's uncomprehendable. Job said in Job twenty eight verse twelve, we won't comprehend God's ways. Ecclesiastes chapter eight, we won't comprehend God Himself. Romans chapter eleven verse thirty three. But Paul says we can begin to comprehend His love. So if you've got your Bibles, open to Romans. Romans is considered Paul's great systematic theology. God's great, or Paul's great letter of wisdom uh, about God's plan. But the reality is Romans is really a love letter. It's the greatest story ever told. Romans 5 verse 5 says the love of God has been poured out. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, therefore we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And he says, verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So verse 6 of Romans 5, we were weak. Verse 8, we were sinners. Verse 10, we were enemies. But God's answer to all three of these in verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10 is Christ himself. So it's important that we understand the love of God to comprehend the love. But why is it important to understand it? I want to give you today in the time that we have together a few reasons why we need to comprehend the love of God. In fact, if we have time, I'd like to give you four reasons, four reasons why we need to comprehend the love of God. Number one, we need to comprehend the love of God so that we will personally appreciate the love of God, that we will personally appreciate the love of God. You know, you'll never be loved like this the rest of your life. This is a one-time only kind of love. We're told to love everyone, but that's a bigger challenge than most of us are able to fully accept. We need to understand his love. Listen to what Paul writes about it. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I, I think about that verse in Romans 8. And the reality is, you can make your own list. I, I believe what God is doing in that text is he's listing all the things that might possibly separate us from the love of God. And his conclusion is, look at this list. Put anything in that list. Height, death, de de demons, anything in that list. It can't separate you from God's love. And, and I think when I think about it, there are things that might separate me from the love of God. But he says the only thing really can separate us from the love of God is our own stubborn will. We have a problem, though. We talk about this beautiful, grace-filled, graceful, merciful, good news, the gospel. We talk about it with passion. But do you realize the love that you sing about is the love that he has for you? God so loved me. You know, we cannot give away what we do not possess. When I preached in Nashville, we had this older lady in the church. Her name was Hood, Sister Hood. Sisterhood had a walking cane and she took the end of that walking cane and she took the tip off and sharpened it. And so when the kids would come in the auditorium, she didn't like children. She'd try to poke them with this, with that stick. And I often used to wonder how you could take some little old ladies that are really sweet and some little ladies that are really mean. And what I learned is that the little sweet old ladies were sweet young ladies filled with the grace of God and filled with the love of God. You cannot give away what you do not possess. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord because he gave me strength, because he trusted me and gave me this work of serving him. Paul had this, oh, wow mentality. How in the world do I get to do what I get to do? Why did God so bless me in this way? So I need to comprehend the love of God so I can personally appreciate it. Number two, I need to comprehend the love of God so that we can share the love of God. I need to comprehend it so that I can share it. Pay attention here. The gospel is not an answer. 
the gospel is the answer. You see, we're we're right now, we're two days here in the States away from an election that's going to say a lot about our future. And there are people that think, oh, who is elected is going to determine the future. They're not going to determine the future. They might have some impact and influence on society. I'm going to be a Christian regardless of who is in that office. There are people who think that money is the answer to everything. If I just have more money, I could be good. There are people who think that you can make the list. Education is the answer to everything. If you just have more, if we just educate everybody, that's not the, the truth is the gospel is the answer. It is the only thing that can make our world better. It is the only thing that can make our cult culture better. You know, we're comfortable talking about what we love. So we should love God so we can start talking about him more. Number three, we need to comprehend God's love so that we can personally keep the right outlook. <clears throat> we need to understand so we can appreciate it. We need to understand it so we can share it. But we need to understand it so that we, so that we can keep the right outlook personally. You know, our world has become a pretty bleak place to be. There is plenty of bad news in this world. God's message is good news. And we are the good news people. And that should change everything in our life. Listen carefully. Because the gospel is in my life, it should mean good news to everyone in my life, not just to me. You know, wouldn't that make everything better? Wouldn't that attract more people if we were the good news people? As I've visited churches these last three years from place to place, I've been to many that are healthy and I've been to some that are not healthy. And I wonder, why are some churches healthy while other churches are not? And the reason I've concluded is because of their perspective, because how they view things. Healthy churches, growing churches, have a spirit of optimism. They process everything through a spirit of optimism. And that shouldn't shock us. God is an optimist. My dad's favorite saying was this, the future is as bright as the promises of God. God's an optimist. We, we read Romans chapter five, part of it earlier, but verse eight says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now you talk about optimism. There it is. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, Philippians chapter one and verse six says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And then I think of Luke chapter 22, near the end of the Lord's life on this earth. He says to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But then in verse 32, Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that you fell not. And when you are strengthened, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. What, what I see there is the optimistic spirit of Jesus. Peter, Satan's going to try to get you, but I prayed for you. He's not going to get you. He's not going to control you completely. Not only is God an optimist, God's people, God's people are optimist. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse six says, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear for what mere people can do to me. He said, no matter what people do to me, the Lord's on my side. God's people are optimists. I can be optimistic for that reason. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we all know that great chapter of charity or of love. One of the verses, verse 7 says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. One of those statements is love believes all things. You know what that means? It means God believes the best, uh, excuse me, the people that love believe the best about others. There's a godly optimism that's there. It grows as a result of confidence. It does not mean that everything in my life is perfect. It doesn't mean that there's nothing I need to improve. It doesn't mean I like everything. It means that in God and with God, I have a confident belief that the future can and will be better and that confidence will affect my emotions. We might say it this way. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. 
how powerful this optimistic spirit of Christians is. Number four, I need to comprehend the love of God so that I can reflect it. So I can reflect it. You know, the text, Jesus gives that great commandment in Matthew chapter 13, love one another. In the world, we need to strive to be like Jesus. I need to know God's love in my life so I can reflect God's love into the life of other people, so I can look like Jesus to people, so that I can be like Jesus in this world. And the reality is, that's what makes the church so special. It's this marvelous group of people. They're imperfect. They don't claim to have everything figured out. But here's what they do. They're trying to reflect the love of Jesus. They're trying to look like Jesus to the world today. That is the plea of the restoration movement, isn't it? We want to try to look like Jesus' church on the world today. Well, you know, we have that title, that name, the Church of Christ. There are other names in the Bible that we could use, the Church of God, the Household of God, the Family of God, simply the Church or the Way. Those are all biblical names for the Church. I like the name Church of Christ because it reflects what we're trying to be. We are the church that is of Christ. We belong to Christ. And so our mission in this world should always be to look like Jesus so that when people think of us, they think those people are like the Lord. Those are some valid reasons, I believe, that we need to strive to comprehend what is not easy to comprehend but to begin to comprehend the marvelous love of God. I thank you for uh, listening today, for the opportunity to be with you. I pray that this lesson has blessed your life. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for letting me be a part of this.